Good morning Interweb, so we left off last time having just created our template map. In this video we're going to fill in our topographies. So I did a little bit of work off camera just to save a bit of time, so to do this I'm going to select, uh, to show you, I'm going to select this template layer, I'm going to go up to opacity, I'm going to set the opacity to multiply, and I'm going to bring the opacity down to maybe 30-40%, something like that. And oh would you look at, we got some ocean currents. I followed the method outlined in my ocean currents video directly, so links to that in all the usual places, go check it out and you'll understand exactly how to do this. The reason why I did this is I can use the currents to help inform how my coastlines might look. So for example, this stretch of coastline here uh, might be quite rugged because it's being battered by these fairly strong currents, whereas this coastline here might be quite a lot smoother because these currents are kind of gliding parallel to the coastline and not hitting it straight on. And of course you can always look for similar setups on an atlas and draw inspiration from those setups. Anyways, so with all that in mind, let's go and hit new layer and we're going to call this layer topo. We're going to bring this down below everything else, we're going to lock our template layer, so everything's locked, we can't disturb anything. All we can do is draw on this topography layer, which is what we want. We're going to hit I on our keyboard to bring up the eyedropper tool. We're going to click our first elevation, 0 and 100 meters. Then we're going to hit N on the keyboard to bring up the pencil tool. Now you should go over to the pencil tool here on the side, double click it to bring up the menu. Your menu is going to look like this. So drag this chap down to accurate to get nice gnarly coastlines. Uh, select fill new pencil strokes. And this guy here is optional. You can select it or deselect it. It's up to you. Play around with it and see which you prefer. I prefer it not selected. And hit OK. I'm going to hit Z on my keyboard now just to zoom into an area to show you the basic idea of what to do here. We are going to go back to N, our pencil tool. And all we're going to do is we're basically going to block in a whole bunch of shapes until we filled up our landmass. Something like this. Now you will need a drawing tablet for this. It is possible to do this with a mouse or trackpad, but it's going to take you until the heat death of the universe to get it done and you're going to develop the worst case of RSI ever. So invest in a drawing tablet. It need not be a expensive drawing tablet, just the cheapest one possible. So that's our, let's say that's our landmass. What we're going to do now is we're going to hit V for our selection tool or go up here. We're going to click on one of the blocks we made. We're going to go to select, same, fill color. That'll select all of our landmass. And then we're going to go to window, pathfinder. And then we're going to hit this chap here, the unite button and boom, everything unites. Now, let's say that you're unhappy with this shape and you want to edit it somewhat. Again, we go back to N on our keyboard for the pencil tool, and let's say you want to add a bay of some description in here. Again, this is, I'm not being uh, very good about my coastlines here. It's, this is just for demonstration purposes. Uh, we'd select the shape. We want to subtract from our other shape. So we select both shapes, and we can go either here to minus front, which will result in this, or we can hit shift M and hold down the alt key and drag through any areas we want to delete. And once you're happy with one layer, you can zoom back out again, hit I for the eyedropper tool, go to your next elevation up, zoom back in, and then draw in, uh, with N selected, with pencil selected, draw in your next elevations. Something like this and then the same thing applies select one go to select same fill color unite hey presto and you just continue on all the way up uh, until you filled out all the elevations you require now there is one more thing sometimes you'll be drawing uh, say you're drawing a coastline like this for example and for whatever reason you just let go of your stylus and you'll end up with this sort of scenario. Instead of deleting this, sometimes it can be advantageous just to hit A on your keyboard, which is the direct selection tool over here. Click on your shape, and then go back to your pencil, N, and then just simply start somewhere near the outside anchor point, and then just drag around to the other anchor point, and it'll complete the shape for you. And those are the basic tools you need to uh, 
block in all your topography. So I am going to zoom back out. I'm going to go to time lapse now. During the time lapse, I'm going to read out and address some of the comments from the previous video, and that'll probably be the format going forward in this series. Without further ado, time lapse engaged. Topography's our goal. Okay, so first comment, Alejandro Jimenez writes that Atlas style looks really awesome, thanks. Thanks goes out to Nathan Manjon, not me, I am but the messenger. Alejandro goes on to write, I have a question, would you recommend Illustrator rather than Photoshop? I've never used the first one. It looks quite similar to Photoshop, but maybe it's better to work with vector images. It is kind of like Inkscape, right? So yes, Illustrator is exactly like Inkscape in that they are both vector programs. And they differ from Photoshop because Photoshop is a raster program. The big difference here is that Photoshop deals with pixels, whereas uh, vector-based programs deal with mathematical equations. TLDR, it allows us to zoom in without losing resolution, which is a really important thing in this process. I used to do a lot of mapping in Photoshop, but it's becoming clearer and clearer to me now that vector is the way to go. Darth Biomech writes, I don't quite understand why G-plates is even necessary for this. Why can't you draw your continents right into Photoshop or Inkscape? So you 100% could do this, but the problem is, the more we go towards the poles, the more distorted your map will become. Because remember, what a map is, it's a 2D representation of a 3D globe. And unless you're some crazy projection savant that can visualize how these projections work, there's no real way of being able to guess what polar continents will look like without drawing on the globe. And you can see this in the previous video. If you look at how my continent looks on the globe, it looks kind of like Antarctica, nothing crazy. But then when we switch to 2D view, it looks completely different. It would be really difficult to draw straight on the 2D plane and get everything correct. This is why it's advantageous to draw in 3D. Ivan writes, I'm sorry, I don't understand what's the point of this channel. Can anyone explain? Hello, Ivan, welcome. You must be new here. <laughs> so this channel is about world building and conlanging. World building is the art of creating fictional settings and conlanging is the art of creating fictional languages. This is what I do here. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you stick around. Daniel Rossi writes, the color gradient you stole from Wikipedia jumps from 200 to 2000 meters below sea level. Is that intentional? Yes, so this is a pretty standard elevation spread that you'll find in a lot of atlases. In fact, I pulled it directly from my reference atlas, which is the Times Concise Atlas of the World. And the reason why there isn't a whole bunch of granularity at the small sea depths is that if you imagine a trench in the ocean, that's gonna drop off real quick. So if you had something like, you know, minus 200, minus 300, minus 400, you'd have all these colors piled right on top of each other and that kind of doesn't really help things. And that would be visually quite confusing. And also we tend to care a little bit less about the sea than we do about the land. So having less granularity here is totally fine. Theo Smith writes, This is neat, but it depresses me at the same time. I'm not much of a computer guy, so this already feels overwhelming. And I only have a very basic web app based laptop and can't download whatever program. Also, I'm not a good drawer. I managed to come up with maps despite all of this, but it's been a very long and difficult process. And of course, my maps don't look anywhere near as good as other people's efforts. Okay, so lots to unpack here. You can totally do this without any computer as you found. And it's actually really cool, admirable thing to do to try and do this by hand. Dealing with polar distortions by hand is gonna be slightly problematic. You could probably go out and buy a cheap ball, draw onto the ball, mark in lines of longitude and latitude on the ball and the equivalent on a sheet of paper and then transcribe segment by segment onto the paper. You could do that. It's very involved though. 
in terms of not being a good drawer, don't worry about it. You will get better over time with practice and with looking at maps. I can't emphasize this enough. Look at maps, buy atlases, go to your library, just look at atlases and look at all the different topographies that exist on Earth. Like Nathan Manjohn, for example, he didn't come out of the womb being a cartographic savant. No, he sucked at the start like everyone else. And it's only with time, with study and with patience that you will get there. And you will 100% get there. Stick at it. And also, if you're really worried about your artistic skills, Google like old maps or ancient maps, you'll see that they're all wonky and stuff because we didn't have such a granular understanding of the world. So with that in mind, maybe treat your lack of artistic skills not as a bug, but as a feature. And the maps that you produce, make them an in-universe document. And if people go like, oh, they, they look terrible or whatever, you can say, well, they haven't yet discovered fully the polar regions and that's why they look all funny and stuff. So there's always work around, just be creative with it. All right, so that is the basic shapes down plus I added in lakes. I also messed up in the middle of doing that. Bit of a brain fart, apologies for that. If you're gonna put in lakes, which obviously you should, a nice way of getting rid of all the lakes in one foul swoop is to use a mask. So let's say we dot in a couple of lakes here. So we do this, 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 just really rough for a second. So as you can hopefully see, I was trying to eliminate them one by one, and that was silly of me. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, go to V, select the shape, go select, same, fill color, and then unite them with Pathfinder. Select your lakes, then select your land, go to opacity, go to make mask, release clip, and then you'll have your mask done. That is so much easier than what I was trying to do. So apologies for that. So with that done, it's time to add in all the rest of the elevations. Now I like to go straight to the highest elevations and work my way back, just because I know where they're going to be given the plate tectonics. Daddy Leon writes, I'm just wondering, what do you need a prime meridian marker for? So that was purely just so I could orientate the continent bang in the middle of the 2D plane. Like had I orientated my world 180 degrees away from where it was, the land masses would wrap around either side of the equi-rectangular map and it just would have looked no good. Sir Fireball 3521 writes, if you could answer a question I had since the first G plates video, how do you make two adjacent plates line up with each other? as in making the border snap. So I don't think there is a snapping function in G plates, Sir Fireball. And that means unfortunately, you're just gonna have to manually line things up. Probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but I'm sorry about that. Now I could well be wrong here. So if anyone knows better, let us know in the comments. Strider writes, my biggest problem I'm facing is creating realistic topography that doesn't require me manually drawing it by hand. Mostly because A, that would take an endless amount of time, and primarily B, it leads to some inaccuracy in terms of realistic geomorphological processes. So I'm gonna hard disagree with you on this. I think computer generated landforms and coastlines, etc., are inaccurate and hand drawing things is accurate. Now this is just my opinion here, so take it as that. But I'm always disappointed when people use fractal generators for land masses or like in Photoshop, for example, cloud layers plus threshold adjustments. Because if you're doing that, you're not taking into account the effects ocean currents have on your land or the effects plate tectonics have. You're, there's no rhyme or reason to the worlds you're creating. It's just, oh, the computer spat out that and I really like it, that goes there now. And that to me is inaccurate. But doing it by hand, doing it correctly by hand, it involves, again, you studying atlases, studying maps, looking at landforms, etc. And applying that knowledge to your maps. And that to me is more accurate. Now, I agree that it takes an awful long time, but I think anything worth doing takes time. 
So just dedicate like an hour a day if you have it, stick on a podcast and just doodle away in Inkscape or Illustrator and eventually you get there. And I think you'll find it'll be a hugely rewarding process. Nathan Manjohn writes, Yay, finally, I've been looking forward to seeing this for so long. I love the way you turned the process around to suit your skill set. Looking forward to seeing the rest of this. So Nathan Manjohn, again, is the person who inspired this entire series. I've basically taken and adapted his workflow that he uses to create his beautiful, beautiful maps. Links in the description, you should go check them out. Nathan, thank you so much for working with me and thanks for allowing me to disseminate this uh, to the rest of Artifexia. You're a top bloke. The Escapist writes, but QGIST, I used Inkscape before, but QGIST came into my life and I have become to be happy now. So this set of videos specifically is centered around Illustrator. I probably won't be looking at QGIST which I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, Q-G-I-S, all capital letters, links in the description. At some stage, I might do a series on using QGIS, but that will be in the future sometime. Adam Petter writes, are you still only using G plates to draw on a sphere? Seems like a weird choice if you're not going to be using any G-plate specific features. So I'm going to disagree with you here slightly, Adam. I use After Effects to edit my regular videos, and I use maybe 10%, 15% of the tools available in After Effects, and I don't use any of After Effects key features. That then doesn't make that a weird choice for me to make my videos, you know? You don't have to use the entirety of a program in order for it to be of value. And the value here is specifically is drawing on a 3D globe. Now, if you think that there is a another application that better suits, by all means, go ahead and use it. People have brought up in the comments that they use Google Earth. Um, I've never tried that before, but apparently it works. Uh, someone mentioned a web app called Map to Globe, which I've used before. It's a bit buggy, but it, it could still work. Someone even used Blender, which unless you already know how to use Blender, I wouldn't recommend that strategy, but fair play to you, pal. Any program that allows you to work on a 3D surface and then export as some sort of vector, ideally, is a good program to use, no matter how much of its capabilities you are using. Okay, so I've been at this for ages, so I'm going to stop it there for today. Next time, we'll complete the map, filling in the seas and the polar continent, etc. Hope you enjoyed. See you soon, Interweb. Good morning, Interweb. As always, I highly recommend checking out Nathan Manjohn's work. Links in all the usual places. It is amazing. He is amazing. Go show him some love. Tell him I sent you. As always, thanks a million for watching my videos and a massive thanks goes out to all the wonderful folks over on Patreon who make artifacts in the reality. In particular, Andrew Pisha Hale, Alexander Roper, Bob, John Hoyer, Ripter Passe, and World Anvil. You all are the best of nerds. Until next time, Edgar out.